At this point in human evolution, eating is a part of all of our lives, and that's not going to change anytime soon. We're in a relationship with the food we eat, whether we like it or not. Now, some people have an awesome relationship with food. For people like us, it's basically a live-to-eat philosophy instead of an eat-to-live philosophy. That's where I fit in. <laughs> but for some of us, we don't like food so much. So what are we supposed to do to improve our relationship? If you look at it, a human being, regardless of where they are on the planet, spends over one hour just eating and drinking a day. That doesn't include shopping for food, preparing food. So what does this mean? You better have a good relationship with food. There are many experiences that can and do lead to an unhealthy relationship with food. The traumas that cause an unhealthy relationship with food tend to circle around uh, issues of receiving in relationships, issues of abundance, and traumas directly related to food. There are many experiences that can and do lead to unhealthy relationships with food. Now, most of these issues stem from traumas that are related to abundance traumas, traumas related to receiving in terms of relationships, body image issues, and of course traumas related to food specifically. But rather than dive into all of these individual ways that we can develop a negative relationship with food, I'm simply just going to dive right in and give you some suggestions for how to improve your relationship with food. Step one, examine your relationship with food. How do you feel about food? How do you feel about eating? If an extraterrestrial landed on the planet to objectively study your eating habits, what would it observe? Assuming that you could see yourself through its eyes, how do you feel about those observations? Can you identify any areas of concern? For example, do you act like you don't care what you eat and consider it a nuisance to have to? Are you hyper-controlling about what you eat? Do you feel guilty when you eat? Do you worry about getting fat when you eat? To directly face and resolve any unresolved issues or previous traumas that are leading to the issues that you have around food. If you have a trauma around food, certain situations involving food and eating, and even specific foods, will cause you to have an emotional and even physical reaction. You can use that reaction to discover the root trauma causing it and to create resolve to the unresolved issues and negative beliefs therein. To learn how to do this, I suggest you try the completion process. The process itself is explained in detail in my book that is quite literally titled The Completion Process. Also, these traumas that are related to food, they cause us to fragment just like any other trauma. So, we have polarized selves around the concept of eating, specifically. To understand much more about this concept and also to see the process to use for this integration between selves internally. Watch my video titled Fragmentation, the Worldwide Disease. Facing and integrating the trauma you have at the root of your negative relationship with food reveals the most powerful steps that we can take personally to improve our relationship with food. Three, I want you to take on a new perspective. I want you to imagine that food is art. Now, if it's just one single food item grown by the earth itself, it is the earth's art. Or if you believe in source and God, it is source or God's art. If somebody is taking those pieces of art and creating another piece of art out of it, be it a recipe or some kind of dish, that is a human creative art piece. But I want you to think about this. Anytime you're in the grocery store, I want you to imagine that you are in a gallery. Same thing if you go to a restaurant. And same thing if somebody in your home cooks for you. You're at a gallery instead. What you are being fed, or what you're looking at potentially eating, is a piece of art. For one week, commit 100% to the practice of looking at any food as if it is art. If you make food, do so with the idea you're creating art, and when you eat a dish that someone created for you, imagine it is edible art. Hopefully, by the end of the week, where you dedicate yourself to this practice, it will be the new, second nature way that you view food. 4. Practice mindful eating. Eating is an intensely somatic experience. It gives rise to all kinds of sensations and emotions. 
It's a full-blown experience, but most of us are so rushed that we don't actually spend any time registering the fact that it's an experience. We don't feel the way that food makes us feel. We don't spend any time thinking about it. We are mindless about the process of eating. When we are not fully present when we eat, and when we eat too fast, we tune out the sensory experience of food. When we do not experience food fully. We take it for granted. We don't extract the full richness out of it. We can't tell how our bodies even respond to certain foods. So when you sit down to eat, give yourself time to do it. The cultures that are the healthiest in terms of their relationship with food take a long amount of time to eat. It's a whole social practice. So what I want you to do is to slow completely down. Give yourself a time period so as to focus 100% on the process and experience of eating your food. This means with no distractions, see the look of the food, smell the food, hear the food. I want you to close your eyes when you take a bite and feel how it affects your body. Most people believe that food or the experience of food is localized to the mouth. It actually isn't. Some foods you can feel through your entire body. They tend to localize in certain areas. They come with different sensations. See if you can notice those sensations. A good trick is that between every bite, you lay your fork down. Five, with any food, whether it's something simple like a peach or something complex like a curry, I want you to think about every single element or energy that went into that food. For example, to get a peach to your table, it had to start as a seed. It had to have soil and sunlight and rain from the clouds and energy from the farmers who grew it and energy from the truck that drove it to the store, etc., etc. What we don't realize is that a single peach is made of all these elements. If you are super attuned, you can taste the season and the rain cloud and the sunlight in a peach. You can also taste the focus that a farmer had towards that particular peach. The amount of effort that went into the creation of this one single thing is absolutely mind-blowing. You are ingesting all of that energy. Imagine tracing the food backward from your table to its origin like a storyline. And when you're doing this with a whole dish like a curry, do this with every ingredient in the dish. Get more sensitive. In order to have a good relationship with food, you've got to be able to feel food. That means you have to feel in the first place. For those of you who struggle with feeling, I suggest you watch my video titled, How to Feel. We must be able to sense our feelings in order to know how food is affecting us, and in order to feel food, to know which food we should even be eating. People who have a great relationship with food, they don't adhere to a strict dietary regimen. What they do is they eat intuitively. So even if you see somebody who seems to have a strict dietary regimen, if they have a good relationship with food, they arrived at that particular way of eating based on being super intuitive, not mentally rigid about their choices. When you go to the grocery store, notice how your body is reacting to certain foods. Notice what it is asking for. One day, your body may really want beans, for example. The next day, it may not want it at all. One day you go to the grocery store and the broccoli may be vital and full of energy and you can see how amazing that would feel to take them into your body. And the next day you may be able to feel that there is some element that went into the creation of that broccoli that makes it lack vital energy, that may even make it poisonous. We have to learn to pay attention to our body's natural cues. We don't usually do this. We respond to hunger in a way where we're afraid of it. We binge eat as a result of it or else we become normalized to it, and we don't feed our body when we need to. Another thing we tend to do is that we don't notice when we're full. So we sit down to a meal and far past when we're full, we continue to stuff food in our throats. It's really important to start to eat according to those cues. The closer your relationship is with your emotions, the closer you will be to being really good at intuitively eating. It will also be obvious to you when you gravitate towards specific foods or eat in certain ways based on trying to get away from a certain emotion. If we're using food to cover over an emotion or get away from an emotion or fill an emotional void, the need we have isn't actually for food, it's for something else. But if we're not conscious of that and we simply eat, then we're not actually meeting the actual need that we have. So attuning to food and our habits around food and our feelings around food, noticing when we're doing that, is a really good way for us 
to get in the middle of that process so that we can meet our actual needs instead of eat to try to cover them up. Most of us are actually pretty good at attuning to foods if we put our attention on it. Most of us simply don't take the time to communicate with our food, so we allow our subconscious to rule our food choices. The more alive a food is and unprocessed, the easier it is to communicate with. Learn as much as you can about food, especially all the positive things about food. Knowledge is empowerment. Foods are not only art, they are the building blocks of your well-being. They are not only a source of enjoyment, they are also medicine. You will have a whole new relationship with lemons, for example, when you learn that it's not just about how a lemon tastes. You can use lemons to lighten hair, to reduce inflammation, to increase your immunity, <laughs> to stimulate digestion, and the list goes on and on. You will have a whole new relationship with your stir-fry dish when you realize that what makes that incredible flavor is the wok that it's cooked in. And the person who's really, really good at cooking through a wok never washes their wok. So, in Asia, that means that pot that cooked your dinner tonight was the very same pot without having been washed that cooked your grandmother's dinner eight or years ago. And so what's happening with the heat is that the pores of the metal are expanding and the flavors from the dish are getting into the pores and then they never come out. So every single dish that you eat is infused with all of those flavors, which is why the flavors are completely non-replicatable. And these walks are so special in these families, they are considered a family heirloom and passed down through generation to generation. Grow your own food and cook your own food. Now some of you will hate growing your own food. That's not going to be your thing. Some will love it. Other people will hate cooking. Others will love it. But I can't tell you how much deeper your relationship will get with the food you're eating when you grow it and or when you cook it. You can still have a wonderful relationship with food if you don't do either of these things, but if you're trying to improve your relationship with food, I want you to at least try this. If there's no way to grow food where you live, watch videos created by people who do love doing that and who are passionate about the process of growing food. Try cooking. Start with something really, really simple. There are so many videos online now and on YouTube telling you how to cook things. Just follow along the process, try it for yourself. You'll see pretty soon whether you like it or hate it. If you like it, you can increase the complexity of the dishes. And if you hate doing that or you don't want to do that, you can simply watch the Food Network. I can't even tell you how good it is to sit down and watch somebody who's really passionate about cooking, cooking and talking about cooking. Stop punishing yourself for what you ate. Guilt is not going to do anything for you because you can't uneat what you ate. Self-punishment is only going to increase the stress levels in your body and make your absorption of food a lot more difficult. And not in a good way, not like difficult in that you're not going to get fat, difficult in that it will make you fatter, yes. What guilt serves to do is to inform you that you think that the decision you made was wrong. So your choice is either you make a different decision today, right now, or you convince yourself that the decision that you made was not actually wrong. Those are the only two ways to get out of guilt. The more stress you have around eating, the worse your relationship is between you and food. Exercising super hard or swinging the pendulum to eat hardly anything so as to make up for what you did after indulging is a recipe for disaster. It puts your body in a yo-yo energetically and physically, which is incredibly bad for the body. Dieting and exercise can be used as a serious form of self-control and self-punishment. It is also self-punishment to keep any problem foods you may have in the house, in the same way that it's a problem to keep alcohol around if you're an alcoholic. Make your relationship with food intensely personal, because it is. You will have a different relationship with food, because your body will need different foods than other people. You will have a different relationship with food than your partner, than your best friend, than your boss, your coworkers, anyone. And the more intensely personal you're willing to make that relationship, the deeper your connection to food will be. You gotta stop comparing what you're eating to what other people are eating. The most important thing to decide is, what is food for you? As your consciousness increases, your sensitivity to foods will also increase. Things you used to be able to eat, you will no longer be able to eat. You will have zero tolerance for them. 
That being said, the energy of restricting yourself is unhealthy when it comes to trying to develop a positive relationship with food. That means, with the exception of foods that are a straight out no for you based on your intuitive sensitivities, I don't want you to prevent yourself 100% from having something because of a mental idea you have about it. So this means, if you feel like having french fries, go ahead and have some. Just make sure you do so at the right time. Timing is a lot when it comes to having a positive relationship with food. Obviously, if you're starving to death, grabbing a whole thing of french fries is not going to be really good for your body. But a person's actually going to be healthier if they allow themselves to have some french fries as opposed to deciding that they cannot touch that food no matter what because of some mental idea they have about the french fry. If someone orders a dessert, let yourself have a spoonful just so that you can feel the ease and flow of the energy between you and the food. Never deprive yourself of food on purpose. Fasting can be super, super healthy when it's done so as to love the body more. But a lot of us do not fast because of this. We fast because of a horrific relationship with food and a hyper-controlling nature towards our bodies. When we fast in this way, it's not self-loving at all. And it destroys our relationship with food. And not only that, we're putting our body into a state of distress, lack of abundance. And yes, actually, that's going to affect your capacity to make money as well. But when we do this, the body gets the message, crap, 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 I can't guarantee that I'm going to be fed, so I need to store it. This means eat regularly. Some people, they feel really good when they eat small little bits throughout the entire day. Some people feel good when they eat three solid meals at standard times. Other people feel good when they eat meals, but not at the standard times that are set forth with the society that you've been raised in. Let yourself intuitively know what the right timing is for you, but allow yourself to have food. Allow food time to be a social experience. Allow it to be a way to give and receive love. Food is an intensely social thing. It has the capacity to unite us. It brings people together. It doesn't matter what culture that we are part of or what continent we live on, the one thing we actually can agree on is good food. It can be especially beneficial to develop relationships with people who have a similar outlook on food in general. For example, if you're vegan and that's what you've been intuitively led to be, becoming friends with other vegans makes meal times much more enjoyable than if you're the only vegan friends with a bunch of people whose favorite thing in the world is barbecue. Let eating be a time of mutually enjoying something. Let it be a shared experience. Eat specifically to feel good, and eat what makes you feel good. Sit with that sentence, because it's really important. If you approach food in this way, your entire relationship to food will have to shift inevitably. This means eat something that makes you feel full of energy. Don't eat something that makes you feel sluggish. If you ate in that way, I can't tell you how much ease you'd have in terms of your relationship with food. Do not eat specifically to change the measurement on a scale or do what you mentally know you should or shouldn't do. Simply pay very close attention to how foods make you feel. Start a food diary. This seems pretty basic and whatever, but it can revolutionize the way that you approach foods, and it can make you aware of all kinds of things you need to change about your relationship with foods. Keep track of your meals and even snacks between meals. With each one, write down what you ate, what the environment that you ate in was like, how the food tasted, looked, and smelled, how it made you feel in your body, somatically, and also emotionally. Describe how much you like the experience of eating that meal from 1 to 10, and then explain why you chose that specific rating. Mealtime is a sacred part of life. It is sacred, and it is special. And because it takes up so much of our time in a day, and there's no way to get around that, we need to make it more so. This means make any change that will make mealtime more special and more sacred to you specifically. For example, you could put special effort into making or having specific foods at specific holidays. You could ensure that mealtimes are a time when every member of the family stops what they are doing to have a joint experience. 
You could choose to eat in bowls and cutlery that are beautiful to you. You could drink out of cups that are fun to drink out of. You could take your takeout food out of the box that it came in and eat it on some china. You could deepen your love of and knowledge of specific ingredients. You could go out of your way to get special ingredients. You could eat with the seasons. Ask yourself, how could you make each time you eat special and even more enjoyable? How you feel about the entire process around food, from growing it, or purchasing it, to making it, to eating it, will dictate the degree to which you are nourished by food, and also what relationship you have with it. Food is much more about the nourishment of soul, emotions, mind, and body than it is about simply staying alive. The more pleasurable you make this process, the better your relationship with food will be. Thank you.